Um, but I want to thank you all for being here and helping us celebrate the past and present and future of American writing. Today's live taping of our author podcast is celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month, and we're proud to feature two writers who were part of our recent exhibit, My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today, which can still be seen on our website online and has extensive uh, educational materials to go along with it for people who want to use it in their classrooms. Um, of our two uh, guests today, Reina Grande is the author of the best-selling memoir, The Distance Between Us, where she writes about her life before and after she arrived in the United States from Mexico as an undocumented child immigrant. The much-anticipated sequel, A Dream Called Home, was released in 2018. Her other works include the novels Across a Hundred Mountains and Dancing with Butterflies, which were published to critical acclaim. The Distance Between Us is also available as a young reader's edition from Simon & Schuster. Her books have been adopted as the common read selection by schools, colleges, and cities across the country. Her most recent titles are A Ballad of Love and Glory, a novel set during the Mexican-American War, and an anthology um, by and about undocumented men and Americans called Somewhere We Are Human, Authentic Voices of Migration, Survival, and New Beginnings. Interviewing Ms. Grande today, Juan Martinez is the author of the short story collection, Best Worst American, winner of the Newcomb Institute Literary Arts Award. His work has appeared in various literary journals and anthologies, including Glimmer Train, McSweeney's, Triquarterly, Conjunctions, Norton Sudden, First, a Sudden Fiction, ah, sorry, Norton Sudden, Sudden Fiction, Latino, short stories from the United States and Latin America, and The Perpetual Engine of Hope, stories inspired by iconic Vegas photographs. Um, if you haven't read his uh, Best Worst American, I encourage you to do so right away. Um, but uh, I want to thank both Juan and Raina for being here and give them a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Hola, buenas tardes. Gracias por estar aquí apoyando este evento. Me da mucho gusto verlos hoy. No, y pues lo mismo. Y creo que eh, lo único que no habíamos discutido antes de empezar era cómo navegar estas sillas <laughs> enormes. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying that we had welcome everybody and also we hadn't planned on the tall chairs. So that was like the one unexpected thing about this whole thing. Uh, Reina, I am so glad that you're here in Chicago. We're lucky to have you. Thank you. And thank you so much for, for being here with me today. No, it's it's my pleasure. And uh, like I'll get back to this a little bit later in the conversation, but like I, I was telling you, uh, and I guess I'm telling private but in public, like you were one of the reasons why like I think I ended up at the like a Latino book festival when I was a graduate student in Las Vegas because you were like the one sending out all the emails. Mm. Uh, so that was that was very nice. Um, so uh, the I wanted to start with some questions about uh, the Ballad of Love and Glory. It's a, a Ballad of Love and Glory. Um, I have lots and lots and lots of like questions about like the the tone, the approach, uh, the fact that it's a really both like necessary and urgent historical story, but it's also like a historical romance. Like there's like mm -hmm. so much. And I was, so we'll talk about all that, but I was wondering if you'd like to, we could like to start with like the timeline that we just noticed. And <laughs> because I think it actually does kind of highlight yeah, the yeah. necessity of books like this. Yeah, let's start, let's start with the tough, the tough one. Tough one. Yeah, so my novel, A Ballad of Love and Glory, or Corrido de Amor y Gloria, it's out in Spanish now, um, is a novel about the US invasion of Mexico in 1846, which culminated with the United States taking half of Mexico's territory with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. So this war or this invasion doubled the size of the United States. You know, it's a, it's a very big defining moment in US history, and yet it has been erased from our collective consciousness it is often left out in our textbooks, in our history books, um, in many different forms. It continues to be erased. And even right now, as I you know, was touring the museum, I noticed the timeline up on the wall 
And guess what's not there? It's not there, the US invasion of Mexico, 1846. What is there is the Battle of the Alamo, which happened in 1836, 10 years before Texas even became part of the United States. So that is Texas history. It's not US history, but it's there. And it's there um, with the caption that Mexican forces attacked the Alamo. And to me, that really bothers me because it implies that Mexico was the aggressor, that Mexico had no right to attack the Alamo, when in fact, Texas was part of Mexico at the time, and the, the Battle of the Alamo was part of the Texas Rebellion, which was began by white Americans who came into Texas, and they wanted to take Texas away from Mexico. So it was a separatist movement. And yet now the myth of the Alamo is all oh, the, the, the martyrs that died at the Alamo that were killed brutally by Santa Ana. And, and there's no context that is provided to, to us when we learn about the, the Battle of the Alamo in relation of how it was a separatist movement, right? And that Mexico had every right to defend itself and to try to retain um, Texas and keep it from, from being um, taken or stolen by these white separatists. So these are some of the things that really infuriate me because I feel that the way we are taught US history tends to be manipulated. It tends to be distorted and also cherry picked you know, we often leave out events that in our history that make, make us uncomfortable or that don't fit into the national mythology, right? So putting up on the timeline, 1846, the US invaded Mexico, I think is one way that we can start to bring back this moment in history and to offer a corrective history of, um, what has really happened you know, throughout, throughout our past, as shameful as it is, we have to acknowledge it because it is our way of learning from our past and trying to be a better nation. And for example, like you know, right now, that's been what's been happening in Russia, right? With the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the US has been very outspoken about that. We have been very critical of Russia but we often fail to acknowledge the invasions that we ourselves have carried out, beginning with the US invasion of Mexico, which was the first time the United States invaded a sovereign nation. So I think like moments like these that are happening right now um, with the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, like these are moments where we can also try to reckon with our past acknowledge what we ourselves have done in terms of our imperialist motives and and try to be a better nation. Yeah, and I was thinking that's actually one of the, the pleasures of reading the novel is that you're kind of getting both a broader context and a you're kind of shedding light into a, a, a pocket of uh, of history that just sort of people kind of forget, right? And people mm -hmm. kind of like, if they remember it at all, it's like, it's a blip, right? Uh, even though it completely reshapes the entirety of like, North and <laughs> like Central yeah, America, right? right? Yeah, I uh, actually, that reminded me of like, two kind of things that I wanted to ask you about that. And uh, let me go ahead and save like the, like the, the weird crafty one for a moment and then just yeah. ask you about like the fact that we're talking like you know you you you, you cite Ansaldúa at the, mm -hmm. the end of your uh, the thing on like borders and of the border as an open wound uh, there is definitely like a weighty pleasure in the novel but it's also I feel like the name Corrido mm -hmm. and then the name like as translated to you know ballad mm -hmm. I think people, if they don't, if they if they hear this stuff, it's, it's history. It's like this thing. It's blah blah blah. It's also like a really fun novel, and I was just wondering, mm -hmm. 
how um, it was, because I, it reminded me of a corrida. It reminded me also of opera in mm -hmm. some ways, and it reminded me also of like a telenovela in like in the best of ways, right? <laughs> well, I think it's funny that you called it fun. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I, I don't mean, think I said. Yeah, I did. I had fun reading it. Oh wow! Well, I'm glad to hear that because. I mean, there's fun, a lot of death. Fun I should is not probably, an adjective yeah. I have heard yet for my novel because I know it's it's a war story. There's a lot of death, know, and yeah. there are, there's a lot of battles. It's very violent. There's like carnage and brutality, and I didn't shy away from that. And I know, like sometimes people go into it thinking that it's a it's a romance, mm -hmm. and and there you know there is a love story, but the love story is the, is not the dominant story. It's really a war story infused with romance. And yeah, and sometimes people are shocked that there's once so they much start, when they start yeah. reading that there's so many battles in there and that, yeah, and, and that it is violent. Well, I mean, honestly, what it reminded me a lot of was the approach that Tolstoy takes in War and Peace, right? Where you have like some very comprehensively researched uh, battleground stuff, but then you have like the kitty romance, right? Like mm. the, the sort of like, uh, and so the, I actually felt that having those two things together was kind of what kept the novel buoyant mm -hmm. and kind of mm -hmm. made it kind of like a deeply enjoyable experience. Yeah. And I know some people would have wanted more romance and less war. But when I wrote the novel, I was very intentional of always centering the war. Yeah. And I feel that, you know, this war has been ignored for so long that I'm not going to do that in my novel. I am going to center it. And it's going to be a, like as a, a character almost, mm -hmm. a central character, as much as, you know, John Riley and Jimena are. And I didn't want the war to be a mere backdrop to my love story. I, I really felt it would have been a disservice to this moment in history that I was trying to highlight. And so I had to make some choices as a writer, you know, like how much of the war do I write in here? How much of the love story do I, do I put in? And like trying to find a balance in a way where the love story never um, like took over, but also the war never took over, but like combining them. Because at the end of the day, I wasn't writing a, a history book about the war. You know, it's a novel. It's a, it's a story about these two people who are trying to help each other survive this very brutal moment where their world is being upended and they don't know if they're going to, to have a future or not, right? And so I wanted to make sure that as much as I was writing about the, the, the war and the history and I wanted to teach my reader all about this history that, that we're not taught in school, I also tried very hard not to lose sight of my characters. Yeah, so this is really funny. Like, I'm just going to show you, like, that was literally the question that I had for you is uh, balancing the love story and the war story. How do you... So let me go ahead and push you a little bit more on that, though. Uh, what were, like, some intentional sort of decisions that you made to make sure that, like, the love story was not overtaking the, the war story? I can see it in the depictions themselves, because the mm -hmm. depictions are pretty unflinching, right? Including like in cases of people who desert, right? I mean, obviously people who get wounded, people who get horribly killed. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, what were like some ways uh, either on a first or second draft or in revision that you sort of like figured out like the balance? For, yeah. yeah. So as I was writing the novel, I created a timeline of events in the history. And I always had it and, you know, I always went back to it to look at it because I didn't want to take any liberties with the history. I didn't want to move the events around so that they fit my plot better. I wanted to always be true to the timeline as the events unfolded. And I didn't want to like distort it or manipulate it because, um, or take a like creative license with it because I didn't want my reader to ever question what was in the book. And so I had to fit my love story into that historical timeline. 
And it was kind of difficult, but also once I got the hang of it, it started getting easier in that I kept the, the story very focused on um, third person limited. So everything you read, it's always from the point of view of Jimena or John Riley. So it's like the like, information, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, so it's always like a very close third person limited. So that means that there's no outside narrator telling the story or, or giving like big history dumps, you know, or, um, or going into other characters' heads or telling you about other things that are happening that my characters are not witnessing. So it's all in their point of view. And then um, every, like every historical moment that I write about, I was always trying to, to weave in my characters as much as I could within that. So there were some, you know, things like, for example, as I was researching, I learned that um, Taylor, General Taylor's quartermaster, Colonel Cross, was murdered by Mexican guerrilla. And I was thinking, how can I bring Jimena into that moment? And then it occurred to me, well, her husband's going to join the guerrilla. And then he's going to be part of that murder, right? And then later on, um, again, like General Taylor's lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Porter, was murdered by Mexican guerrilla when they were looking for Colonel Cross. So then I was, I was bringing in Jimena's story again into that. And then I had Joaquin murder Lieutenant Porter. Um, so, so that's how I was like bringing it in all the time. Like this is how I'm placing my characters always in these things that are unfolding. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a difficult process, but I, I really like how I ended up being able to always fit in these two characters into that, that history. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, about the, the pleasures and challenges of historical fiction, right? Uh, and I think you answered that. But I, I was kind of curious as to, this is your third novel, yes? Like, yes. Yes, so, uh, but it's your my, first historical mm -hmm. fiction. It's my sixth book. Sixth but book. My first third. historical. Yeah, your novel. very first historical. Um, what were some things that, uh, that were definitely new, because I feel like every book is gonna come in with new things, but what yeah. were some, even after six books, there's something about historical fiction that I imagine came with its own set of challenges, research obviously, mm -hmm. fitting the characters in. Was there something that you had not expected, either as a challenge or as an opportunity about mm -hmm. the, this particular genre? Yeah, well, I mean, every book has its challenges. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the fallacy of, of uh, new writers is thinking that the next book's going to be easier, and it never is. Never. It never gets easier. But this book was very different because it's a complete departure from anything I've ever attempted. You know, my, my previous two novels are contemporary fiction. Um, sort of auto fiction in a way because I used a lot of my own experiences to write those novels. And then of course I wrote the memoirs, you know, which are about my own experiences, my own lived experiences. But it's all, all everything has come from within me. So like every time I would sit down to write, I always turn inward to, to find a story inside of me. With this novel, it was completely different. Even the style, my writing style, completely changed. And if you were to read the novel without my name on it, it would never occur to you that it's my book. It's that different. But I, I, it was something that I wanted to do because I like to challenge myself with my writing. Like I don't want to keep writing the same, you know, the same thing, the same style, the same approach. I, I want. I want to try different things. And with this particular book, I never thought um, that I was ever gonna write a historical fiction. I kind of feel that this book found me instead of me finding it. You know, it came to me uh, at an event. Actually, I was promoting um, The Distance Between Us in 2013. And um, somebody in the audience at an event that I did asked me, 
if I had heard of the St. Patrick's Battalion. And I said, no, who are they? And they said, oh, you know, the St. Patrick's Battalion was a unit in the Mexican army composed of deserters from the U.S. Army. And most of them were Irish. And they deserted to help Mexico defend itself against the United States. And he said, you should write a book about them. And then I said, no, I don't want to write that book. It would be about war, about soldiers, about military and battles and like 19th century and a, a, a historical moment I didn't know anything about. So I had like all these reasons why I wasn't going to ever write that book. But then I came home and I kept thinking about the St. Patrick's Battalion. I kept thinking about these men who risked their lives to desert the U.S. Army and to switch sides to try to help Mexico. And I, I was wondering, why did they do it? You know, why, why would they do such a thing? What was driving them? And then I started reading books about the St. Patrick's Battalion, about John Riley. And one day, a scene finally came to me in John Riley's point of view. And then I knew, like, okay, I think, I think this book is not letting me go. You know, it, it, it wants me to write it. And then um, I was still kind of on the fence about it. But I went to Maryland in 2014. Um, the, the Maryland Humanities Council picked the distance between us for their one book, one Maryland. And I was touring the state. And during one of my days off, I went to Fort McHenry. And there was a timeline, all these timelines. <laughs> there was a timeline on the visitor center listing all the wars that the U.S. had participated in. And guess which one was missing? <laughs> yeah, the Mexican-American War. Yep. And when I saw that, I said, okay, I think I need to write this book because I don't know much about this time period. Um, there's been a deliberate erasure about this war, and, and, and something is telling me that, that I do have to like, give myself to this story and, and bring it to life. That is so cool. And uh, it actually brings me to like, like a weird moment of recognition, uh, because I'm, I'm from Colombia, and uh, uh, one thing that like all the Colombians, like the Venezuelans, the Colombians, everybody knows is that uh, like Bolivar's most valuable general, uh, Colonel was actually Irish. Uh, it's uh, O'Leary, and I wanna, I, I wanna say it's Stephen O'Leary, but I think it uh, like, I don't know if anybody's doing homework and somehow ended up listening to this for whatever reason, you should definitely Google that and that cite this, but O'Leary was the, uh, with that colonel's last name and so there's like and and again like a very celebrated irish brigade that actually was instrumental in like getting spain out of uh, out of like gran colombia out of like mm -hmm. the you know that part of uh so there is like that moment it's like oh the irish again like helping out that's very nice but it also made me think about like stuff that happens here but stuff that we can abstract later is mm -hmm. it's there's not like there is like a real, I think, like if you've ever been colonized, right? There's like a like a real sense of kinship, yeah, uh, between. And between yeah, and that's yeah. the reason why I felt such a strong emotional connection to John Riley, because as I was researching um, Irish immigration in the 1900s, the Irish diaspora, and I felt very strongly that there were so many parallels between the Irish immigrant experience and the Latino immigrant experience. You know, and even though nowadays we look at Irish Americans as being part of um, mainstream society, you know, benefiting from white privilege, in the 1900s, their white skin did not protect them from discrimination, from prejudice, from nativism. And they were probably racist cartoons. They, yeah, yeah. They were severely, severely mistreated in the US Army. And fifty percent of the US Army at this time was foreign born, with twenty five percent were Irish 
and then the rest were Germans and Italians and Scottish and Poles. And of course, most of them were poor and Catholic. And so they experienced so much discrimination and um, religious prejudice. And of course, part of, part of the, the reason why they ended up, you know, some of them ended up deserting and switching sides to fight for Mexico was because of their religion. As Catholics, they couldn't bear the thought of going into a Catholic nation and, and you know, and, and, and participating in, the, in this war, in this unjust war. And then of course, many of them like the Irish had a history of oppression by, Eng by England. You know, they had been um, colonized, they had been uh, dispossessed of their lands by the English. So they knew exactly what it was like to be invaded by a Protestant nation. And so they felt that Mexico could turn into another Ireland. And that was another reason why some of them ended up wanting to help Mexico. And so in my novel, like these are some of the things that I bring into John Riley's decision to desert, you know, like setting up that, that, that decision because it was very difficult and he was gonna risk his life and there was no turning back once he made that decision. But there were all these things that was driving him to do it, you know, being, being Catholic, wanting um, to help Mexico keep keep its independence and its freedom and, and keep keep it from becoming another Ireland. And so he made the decision. He he threw himself into the Rio Grande, swam south, joined the Mexican ranks, and then later that year, um, President General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana created the St. Patrick's Battalion with John Riley as its leader. And then of course, John Riley was recruiting. He, he was recruiting um, Irish and other foreign soldiers in the US Army to get them to come over to the Mexican side. And I want to say like one thing that the novel does really well too is actually lays the groundwork for like the horrific consequences of desertion uh, with just this sort of like incredibly harsh punishment for even mm -hmm. petty offenses, right? I'm thinking of the uh, the kid at the very beginning who gets branded, mm -hmm. right? For Maloney. Is, yeah, Maloney, just for is it over drinking or just yeah, like, for, yeah for drinking for just drinking? Yeah, they used to they used to brand them on the forehead with the letters H D for habitual drunkard, or they would hang them by their thumbs for like not saluting their officers properly, and they would hang them from a tree by their thumbs, or they would put them up on a, on a wooden sawhorse with their hands tied behind their backs like this for hours. And sometimes they would fall off. And just break their necks, And they right? would break their necks because with their hands tied behind their backs, they, they couldn't break the momentum of their fall. And so sometimes their necks would be broken. So these are some of the like so extreme abuses that the foreign soldiers were experiencing in the US Army. Right, and that's just for like bad behavior, not, not mm -hmm. trying to like if they caught you trying to run away, that that would have been mm -hmm. the end, right? So, no, I, I thought that was actually really uh, like a really smart narrative choice in in a book that has a bunch of really smart narrative choices. I just thought it was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That. We could talk about Jimena. I feel no, like I'm no, always no, we talking talk about, about John Riley. Why don't we talk about Jimena for a little bit? I adore him, but no, no, of course. And Jimena is <laughs> but fantastic. I do like my Jimena too. Jimena's <laughs> awesome, and like, I, I think Feisty's too condescending a word, but I just want to find like the right like. She's this wonderful, strong person who's just so sh like. So she has such a good moral compass. I guess mm -hmm. would be like the first thing that I would start with, but. Uh, how did Jimena come to be? How did she yeah. show up? So I really like that in the in the Spanish cover they put Jimena there. Yeah. And uh, you know with the rebozo and everything, which I which I really like. And um, Jimena, I actually I kind of didn't like her for a long time because <laughs> she was kicking my butt. Like John Riley came to me so easily. 
I did not have to work that hard in creating him and writing about him. And maybe because he's a real historical figure and I read like several history books about the San Patricios that I was able to learn enough about him to be able to, to write. But Jimena, I didn't know anything about her except that I found her in a poem written by John Greenleaf Whittier. It's a poem called The Angels of Buena Vista. And he wrote it in 1847 during, during the war. And I was very surprised at that poem because it was very pro-Mexican at a time when most of the writing that was coming out of the US was anti-Mexican. But John Greenleaf Whittier wrote this poem that celebrates the courage of the Mexican women who would go into battle with their men. And you know, and I know the las soldaderas, right? Like mm -hmm. everybody knows the very iconic soldaderas from the Mexican Revolution, but there have always been soldaderas in all the wars that Mexico has fought in. But the reason why we know soldaderas from the revolution is because by then cameras existed. And so we have all these like photographs of these um, female soldiers with their escopetas and their cartridge <laughs> belts and looking really tough. But they, they were soldaderas during the Mexican-American War. And so this poem that John Greenleaf uh, Whittier wrote honors that. And, and his poem is about a woman named Jimena who's out in the battlefield tending the wounded. And when I found the poem, I knew that I had found my female protagonist because I, I was fascinated by it. And I love the name Jimena also, which is not a very common name. So I, I, really, I always wonder where did Whittier get that name from? Because, you know, I would expect him to name her Maria or something, but Jimena, which is a, a non-common name, um, it's, it just, I thought it was so beautiful. And I started to wonder, who is she? How did she end up in that battlefield? Who did she lose during this war? What's driving her to risk her life to be there, you know, in, in at, the, at the front lines of this war? And it took me a long time to figure, figure her out. And the moment I had a, a breakthrough in, in her story was when I started to, to do more research into the Texas Rebellion because I had mostly focused on the U.S.-Mexican War, but then I realized that what set the stage for the Mexican-American War was the Texas Rebellion. And so then I had to read like all these history books about Texas and, and the Texan insurrection. And once I understood how, how those events that unfolded in Texas, um, how they affected the, this moment that I was trying to capture, then I decided, okay, Jimena has to be from Texas. She has to be at Tejana. She has to be from San Antonio. Her family participated in the Texas Rebellion, and they fought against Mexico. So they, they betrayed mm -hmm. the Mexican people by allying themselves with the white Americans who were trying to take Texas away from Mexico. And this haunts her. And this is what's driving her to now finally be on the side of Mexico. And then um, all of that came into play once Jimena is forced to become Santa Ana's per, uh, personal nurse, because then she gets to question him and say, what the hell were you thinking You know, in Texas? And why did you do what you did? And then it also gives the opportunity for Santa Ana to defend himself. And that was something that I, I, I deliberately set out to do, to give him a chance I, to, 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 to defend himself. I was going to say, like, that's actually one of the, the big surprises of the book, because um, I, uh, as somebody who, you know, came to the States from Colombia, like, I have, like, uh, like, my own relationship to Mexico and to, you know, the writers of Mexico and people like Octavio Paz, but, like, my like knowledge of Santa Ana, I think, had been so colored by the US, right? And so uh, he always kind of comes across as a cartoon mm -hmm. and- Yeah, one dimensional villain. Yeah, one dimensional villain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this, you really, 
made them a lot more complicated, which was uh, just really cool. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I didn't want to keep repeating that that depiction of him as a cartoonish or yeah, yeah like you know, one there's one dimensional villain that attacked the Alamo and killed um, Bowie and Crockett and Travis. I I wanted to give him his complexity because he was a very complex man. Uh, he's the most hated man in Mexico now, <laughs> but he was president of Mexico 11 times, you know? And, and um, sometimes the Mexican people hated his guts and other times they were like, come back, come back, we need you, you know, you're our hero. And then they will like hate him again and kick him out of the country and then they'll bring him back again. And so a person like that, who can be president of a country over and over and over again has to be very complicated and complex. And um, so I read like uh, a lot of biographies about Santana in Spanish and English. And then I read his memoirs where he lies a lot. So don't believe his <laughs> memoirs. He, he, he lied so much. But I was able to, I was able to hear his voice. And so in the book, when I, whenever I would write his scenes, he, um, he's a very charismatic person. You know, he had so much charisma, but he's also a narcissist and he's self-centered and he's, he is hungry for power. You know, he likes having power. Um, but then there's also some, some moments of vulnerability there, you know, that Jimena gets to witness in him, um, especially that moment when he breaks down and cries in front of her. And so to me, like, it was really important to bring out all his, his contradictions and, and, and his mood swings and, and, or, or shifts in, in, in moods and, and, um, and it complicated her Jimena's interaction with him because she also realizes that he's not this one dimensional villain you know that that there there is much more to this man yeah so i'm gonna go ahead and do like a a segue that is also hopefully both a segue and also a like a, a way that i'll say in we'll have a, a moment to do questions very very soon but if you want to know more about Jimena and Santana and Mr. John Riley. They are all in the book, and the book is right there, right behind us. So everybody should buy like a bunch of copies for. Yes, right? I mean, oh, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but the idea of like uh, giving everybody their full due, like making sure that people are people in all their dimensionality and complexity, brings me to like the title of the anthology you put together, mm. right? Uh, which is somewhere we are human, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to shift a little bit and talk, if you didn't mind, about your like life as both a literary citizen, as a person who puts things together, as somebody who has, is in her sixth book. Um, and but let's, if you don't mind, begin with like the the act of putting that anthology together and the moment of that happening. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Somewhere We Are Human is an anthology that I co-edited co with Sonia Guignansaka, who is a, a poet. And we came together to create this anthology of immigrant voices, but in particular, undocumented immigrant voices, because both Sonia and I were um, previously undocumented, and we both came as children. You know, Sonia came from Ecuador, when, she, when they were five and I came from Mexico when I was nine. So we have a, a shared experience and they grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, but we wanted to, to make space for other undocumented voices to be heard. And to me that was really important because you know, there's not enough opportunities for undocumented immigrants to be able to tell their stories on their own terms. And so we pitched the project, it, um, HarperCollins supported, gave us the green light, and then we put out a call for submissions. And we had several submissions, um, like 150 submissions, plus we also invited 
other writers to contribute, you know, established writers. So we ended up creating this anthology that features um, immigrants from over 20 countries. And many of them are L Latino immigrants, but there's also immigrants from like Korea, from Vietnam, from Bangladesh, from Brazil, from the Philippines, because we wanted to make sure that people understood that the undocumented experience is not just a Latino experience. You know, there's so many undocumented people from all over the world. And so we tried to include as many non-Latino voices as we could. But even within our Latino contributors, we also wanted a diversity there because they're not all Mexican, you know? Uh, <laughs> there's so many like Latino, undocumented Latinos from different countries. So we included voices from like El Salvador, from Ecuador, from Peru, Argentina, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic. So there's this, this diverse range of voices in this anthology. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful anthology. It's very unique in that it's, it's a project that was edited by undocumented immigrants. The contributors are all undocumented or were undocumented. And even the cover, there's like this beautiful dandelion um, that's embroidered. And it, it was, it was um, made by an undocumented immigrant as well. So the, the whole project is a beautiful creation and, and I really hope that, that you pick it up as well. And it's, it's also, it's right next to a ballad of, of love and glory to see. Just saying. Although we have some amazing people in the audience who have all the books. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you have a super fan over oh. here. Uh, that does remind me, it is uh, 145. Um, I think it's probably a good time to start. If, if people want to ask a question, just come on back here and grab the microphone. I'm going to start with a question or, or well, a couple, an observation. I, when you were just talking about the undocumented and the connection then to Riley, you know, a lot of people assume that in Chicago, you know, undocumented might mean Latino or Mexican, but um, there are also thousands of undocumented Irish in Chicago today. It's right. actually one of the largest groups of undocumented in the city. Um, and, uh, um, but, so that's something that's often forgotten, but I think it's an interesting connection between the two works. Um, I just wanted to ask, you were telling the story about the idea for this book coming from someone who asked you at an event about what you knew about this and that you should write this book. Have you ever seen that person again? No, no, I haven't. <laughs> I have not been able to track him down. Oh, well, I hope that at some point he sees this um, online or finds a chance to find out that uh, you asked that question or that, that, that you followed up all these years later on his idea. And Reina, am I wrong and I may be misremembering this, but you do sort of like mention that story too in the acknowledgements, right? Or mm -hmm. am I, yeah, so yeah, hopefully I maybe yeah. the person will read it and it's like, wait a minute. And if you have any ideas oh, yeah, for any book my ideas next for Reina, book, that's, uh, give them to me because it seems that, that I do listen to my readers. <laughs> Usually like people ask, what are you going to write next? And it's like, I like, I like that other place. Like, okay, why don't you write this? And it's like, uh -huh. all right. Right. Yeah. Um, other questions? I see someone. I think I see somebody. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I'm from Massachusetts. Uh, we have a great. Uh, I'm myself. I'm originally Albanian. Uh, we have a great Albanian population with undocumented immigrants. Um, I have friends. Uh, I myself. I was naturalized eventually. I came with a green card. I didn't go through that experience. But I'm wondering, what's a human truth in your experience that anyone uh, that, that sort of resurfaces sort of like a common denominator throughout all cultures that you have realized that um, echoes, uh, even with people who are far away from LA that you're from or Texas where uh, there's a great undocumented uh, population of Mexicans or other areas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, there's a universality to the immigrant experience. And I feel that it doesn't matter what country you come from, there's similar traumas that we all experience, you know, having to leave our homelands, being forced 
to leave your homeland, to go to another place where you may not be welcomed, and then having to create a new home somewhere else when the future is so uncertain, especially when you're undocumented, you live day by day with that uncertainty. And so these are you know, similar traumas that, that we share, but I also feel, and, and it's reflecting, you know, it's re it reflects in the anthology, Somewhere We Are Human, that even though we have this universal experience, every immigrant um, story is singular in its own way. And so we need to celebrate that as well. Right. Um, and my other question was regarding the latest book. Um, obviously, you've done a lot of research. And you said yourself that you didn't want the historical part to be sort of like a backdrop of the love story. You wanted them to maybe, I don't know, dance together or maybe the love story to sort mm -hmm. of fill into the, um, the historical part. How did you see your audience in your mind as a writer shift? And who are you trying to sort of target in, in raising awareness uh, regarding that historical event? Mm -hmm. Well, I have different audiences in mind. You know, I have, um, for example, with the Mexican American community, mm -hmm. I really wanted the book to empower this community because for so long, we have been made to feel that we don't belong here, that we're the outsiders. And yet in learning our history, we realize, wait a minute, we were here first. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, I mean, like the state that I call home, California, like I've grown up there um, most of my life and I've, I've been told by dominant society that I'm the foreigner, right? That I'm the outsider and that speaking Spanish is bad and that I shouldn't do that. And, and then in learning this history and understanding the history, I became empowered and I realized I'm not the foreigner here. I'm not the outsider here. You know, I do have a right to call California my home. And so to me, that's really important for us to empower ourselves and reclaim this history because we, we, we do um, need to acknowledge that the Mexican American community is part of, of this country and has always been, even before um, th this territory, you know, that, that the United States took from Mexico belong to, to the United States. So that to me is important. But in general, like I just want readers to start to understand how we cannot continue to erase moments in US history that don't fit into the national mythology. You know, we need to, we need to, I think we, we need to demand for a corrective history. And in doing that, we're also trying to make sure that we don't continue to lie to ourselves about what country we are and what country, what kind of country we have been. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, the more we learn about our history, even if it makes us uncomfortable, the more we can together decide what kind of country we really want to be. Thank you. Well, first I want to thank my older sister for inviting me. I have never been to this museum. We're from the Mexican community of Pilsen. Um, so yeah, no, that, amazing. Your work is amazing. Um, I'm learning about your work for the first time. I've never read your novels. My sister said you are her favorite writer. And so I'm like, OK, I'm going to come with you. Um, so in terms of, so I actually had heard of this brigade that you're talking about and wanted to actually start up a, a band <laughs> called the San Patricios for a while. I'm not a musician, but it was just a fantasy. But, but in terms of the, I, I just wanted to go to this question of erasure, you know, and you're making some really important points about the timelines and that specific war and us not being foreigners. And I think that's super important. And recently, we went back to our parents' home in Mexico, because uh, my, my dad passed away recently. My mom had already passed away. Anyway, the point is, when we were there, it's like we were connecting with an indigenous kind of family history that 
we hadn't really, it's like we've known like with my grandmother, but like mm -hmm. it's erased mm -hmm. in Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you were saying, give me an idea of things to write about. It seems like that is something that we also need to reckon with, the erasure mm -hmm. of that part of our history. Like, mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if that's something that you've been thinking about because I'm thinking yes yeah. no we're not mm -hmm. I've always thought we're not foreigners here because of the Mexican American war and things like that but lately I have felt called and pulled in acknowledging the erasure mm -hmm. by Mexico of indigeneity yeah, right and so I was wondering if that's something mm -hmm. that you've thought about yeah no I mean that's really important too because in Mexico we seem to romanticize our indigenous past and even like we put it in our pesos right like there's the aztec calendar and there's like all this like um aztec or in indigenous things that we see but that's just celebrating the past whereas it's still present there are all these indigenous communities in mexico and they're the poorest communities in mexico and that's why like some of the states that have the largest indigenous population are the poorest states in the country like guerrero where where i'm from uh, oaxaca you know chiapas um, michoacan like the, these are these are states that have large indigenous populations and they're relegated to the margins of society and they're forced to live in extreme poverty and they're denied resources and yeah we keep denying that their existence to me that that is an important conversation that that we do need, we do need to have as be, as a um a people because you know if we if we want to demand that we be seen that we be heard in this country we also have to make sure that that is happening in mexico as well and Mexico has a lot of contradictions and sometimes very hypocrite too, because, you know, over here, we're always demanding that like Mexican immigrants be treated with respect. And yet in Mexico, they abuse immigrants, right? Like the Central American immigrants, all the immigrants that have to pass through Mexico to get here, oftentimes, I mean, they, they suffer so much going through the country because Mexican tends, Me Mexico tends not to be very kind to to immigrants so these are some of the things that we do need to reckon with as well as a mexican people and not just like you know with the indigenous community but even with with the with the black community too because in in mexico we that is our, our tercera, la tercera raíz es africana and yet we're constantly also erasing that part of ourselves and um afro latinos continue to be relegated to the margins of our communities. Um, they, they don't oftentimes, you know, we're not seeing them, we're not hearing them, we're not including them in our conversations. So um, that also needs to change as well. Okay, one last call for a question. Yep, I'm gonna hand the mic to you. My name is Marlon. Um, my question is, would you ever think about writing a book about women working today? I know I used to come from working from a medical field, and now I'm considered working in a man's job. Mm. I am a HVAC tech. I went into working for my dad. He owns the business. So when I do go to homes, sometimes if I'm the first one to knock, they don't want to let me in because you're a woman. What are you doing? the HVAC tech, how are you gonna fix my air conditioner or my heater? Um, but as soon as they see him, oh, you're with him. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. let me let you in. Mm -hmm. They still don't acknowledge us as doing, I guess you can say, a man's job. Right. Do you ever see yourself writing a book about women today? Like mm -hmm. stepping women up in Women working role? in a men's world? Yeah, stepping up in that, yeah, I mean, in that, that role, I mean, we're badasses too. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that is that is something that we're still dealing with, right? With women that, that in, in every industry, like there's always 
that um, sexism that we have to encounter, even in the publishing business too. I mean, as a woman, especially as a woman of color, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also having to deal with some, with some of that sexism as well, and and um, and racism and and all of these things because the publishing industry, when you're a man, there's sometimes a lot more opportunities too. You know, so I I think that this is a story that you need to write as well, you know, mm -hmm. because it seems that this experience that you're having is an experience that so many women could relate to. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I would, I would love to read that story. If you love to read, then it means you can write. That's like, that's all it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, thank you. Well, with, your, uh, with that, I would like to thank both of you for being here today and for helping us to record our next podcast and um, for being here for everybody who's here um, and telling your stories. So thank you, Reina. Thank you, Juan. And let's give them a big round of thank applause. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I really appreciate you joining in on our conversation. <laughs>